outcome-based education isn't anything more, really, than a socialist system of, of education. Or committing suicide, becoming a drug addict. You don't know what you're going to get. The parents of America are, paying, are playing Russian roulette with their children's lives in the public schools. Russian roulette. H.R. 6 will be remembered as a bill that forever changed the United States of America. Those who control education control the mind of America. That control must stay in the hands of the people and not the government. The student will sit in front of a classroom computer like this and he will drill and drill and drill, not on academic challenges, but on the non-academic curriculum that will gradually change every attitude the government does not like. I'm Ann Wilson. I'm here to talk to you today about something very dear to all our hearts, and that's our children. In America today, we're graduating more than one million students that are functionally illiterate. That means they can't even read the diploma that's being put into their hands. It seems more important today that we graduate Johnny, send him first grade, second grade, third grade, whether he's completed the necessary work or not. How's Johnny going to feel when he graduates, finds out he's not near as smart as he thought he was, and can't get a job? When I was researching for my book, Pavlov's Children, I ran across a report in congressional records that absolutely floored me. I read the whole thing, and I didn't want to believe it, but there it was in front of me. I didn't have much choice. It was an investigation of tax-exempt foundations. It became known as the Reese Committee Report. This was put into congressional record in 1954, and that's when the 83rd Congress was in. That was a long time ago, but it told me at that point they were planning to change the educational system. I want to read you just one paragraph out of this 432-page monster, and maybe you'll understand why I was so upset when I read all of it. On page 141, it says, By manipulating society, you can change not only society itself, but also the people in it. Theoretically, a society could be completely made over in something like 15 years, the time it takes to inculcate a new culture into a rising crop of youngsters. That's called social engineering, and that's what's going on in our system now. We're about to take a quantum leap into the last phase of this educational system they're wanting to put in, and it's called outcome-based education. In 1982, G. Edward Griffin of American Media interviewed Norman Dodd, who was the staff director of the Congressional Special Committee that produced the Reese Committee Report. In this report, he explains what's going on. Now, Mr. Dodd will be talking mostly about minutes that they searched in the Carnegie Foundation. We know today that Carnegie is very involved in outcome-based education. So is our First Lady. What we need to hear now is what Mr. Dodd had to say about this. You'll notice that he's quite elderly, and Mr. Dodd had nothing to gain or nothing to lose by doing this interview. As Mr. Griffin explains to you, Mr. Dodd passed away shortly after this interview was done. Listen closely to what Mr. Dodd is telling you, and then you'll understand what's happening to your children's education. The story you are about to hear represents a missing piece in the puzzle of modern history. Without this knowledge, many contemporary events are simply beyond understanding. You are about to hear a man tell you that the major tax-exempt foundations of this land, since at least 1945, have been operating to promote a hidden agenda. And that agenda has nothing to do with the surface appearance of charity, good works, or philanthropy. This man will tell you that the real objectives include the creation of a worldwide collective estate, including the Soviet Union, which is to be ruled from behind the scenes by those same interests which now control the tax-exempt foundations. The man who tells this story is none other than Mr. Norman Dodd, 
who in 1954 was the staff director of the Congressional Special Committee to Investigate Tax-Exempt Foundations, sometimes referred to as the Reese Committee, in recognition of its chairman, Congressman Carol Reese. The interview you are about to see was conducted by me in 1982. I had no immediate use for the material at that time, but I realized that Mr. Dodd's story was of extreme importance, and since he was advanced in age and not in good health, I simply wanted to capture his recollections on videotape while he was still with us. It was a wise decision because Mr. Dodd did pass away just a short time afterward. In recent months, there has been a resurgence of interest in the substance of Mr. Dodd's story, and we have decided to make it available to the general public. Can you tell us what the Reese Committee was attempting to do? Yes, I can tell you. It was operating and, and carrying out instructions embodied in a resolution passed by the House of Representatives which was to investigate the activities of foundations as to whether or not these activities could justifiably be labeled un-American without, I might say, defining what they meant by un-American. But that was the, the, the resolution and um, the committee had then the task of selecting a council and the council in turn had the task of selecting a staff and he had to have somebody who would direct the work of that staff and that was what they meant by the director of research what were some of the details the specifics that you told the committee at that time well mr griffin in that report i specifically um, uh, number one defined what was to us what was meant by the phrase un-American and we defined that in our way as being um, a determination to effect changes in the country by um, unconstitutional means we have we have plenty of constitutional procedures assuming that we wish to effect a change in the form of government and that sort of thing. And therefore, any effort in that direction which did not avail itself of the procedures which were authorized by the Constitution could be justifiably called un-American. That was the start of educating them up to that particular point. The next thing was to educate them as to the effect on the country as a whole of the activities of large endowed foundations over the then past 40 years. What was that effect? Sir? That effect was to orient our educational system over away from support of the uh, principles embodied in the Declaration of Independence and implemented in the Constitution and educated them over to the to the idea that the task now was um, as a result of the orientation of education to uh, um, away from these brief principles, briefly stated principles and self-evident truths and that's what had been the effect of the wealth which was which con constituted the endowments of those foundations that had been in existence over the largest portion of the span of 50 years and held, holding them responsible for this change and uh, what we were able to bring forward was that the that what we had uncovered was the determination of these large endowed foundations through their trustees to actually get control over the content of American education. Then time passes and we are eventually in a war, which would have been World War One. 
And at that time, they record on their minute a shocking report in which they dispatched to President Wilson a telegram cautioning him to see that the war does not end too quickly. And finally, of course, we are, <clears throat> the war is over. At that time, their interest shifts over to preventing what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914 when World War I broke out. And they arrive at that point, they come to the conclusion that to prevent a reversion, we must control education in the United States. And they realize that that's a pretty big task. So it's to them, it is too big for them alone, so they approach the Rockefeller Foundation with the suggestion that that portion of education which is could be considered domestic be handled by the Rockefeller Foundation and that portion which is international should be handled by the endowment. And they then decide that the key to the success of these two operations lay in the, an alteration of the teaching of American history. So they approach four of the then most prominent teachers of American history in the country, people like Charles and Mary Byrd, and their suggestion to them is will they alter the manner in which they present this subject and they get turned down flat. So they then decide that it is necessary for them to do, as they say, build our own stable of historians. And, if, and then they approach the Guggenheim Foundation, which specializes in fellowships, and say, when we find young men in the process of studying for doctorates in the field of American history, and we feel that they are uh, the right caliber, will you grant them fellowships on our say-so? And the answer is yes. So under that condition, eventually they assemble 20. And they take this 20 potential teachers of American history to London. And there they're briefed into what is expected of them when as and if they secure appointments in keeping with the doctorates they will have earned. And um, that, new, that group of 20 historians ultimately becomes the nucleus of the American Historical Association. And then toward the end of the 1920s, the endowment grants to the American Historical Association $400,000 for a study of our history in a manner which points to what can this country be, can it look forward to in the future. And uh, that culminates in a seven volume study book study, the last volume of which is, of course, in essence, a summary of the contents of the other six. And the essence of the last volume is the future of this country belongs to collectivism administered with characteristic American efficiency. Now that you've heard Mr. Dodd, I feel certain that you understand what my concerns are. Next, we need to look at Bill and Hillary Clinton. The President and First Lady continually tell us how much they care about our children. Since Bill Clinton was elected, he's worked very hard to get Goals 2000 and House Resolution 6 passed through the Congress. Both of these bills will totally reform our educational system. There's a special school in Arkansas called the Governor's School. Our President says it's his dream come true. 
After listening to Mark Lowry, former public director of the Governor's School, you will know exactly what our President and First Lady want for the future schools of America. In 1979, the man who had governed Arkansas for more than a decade implemented an agenda, an activist agenda intended to change the future of the state. The essence of that agenda is perhaps best reflected in the Arkansas education bureaucracy, a crucial part of the Clinton administration and Clinton plan for the future. The policies that drive the education agenda in Arkansas are specific, unusual, somewhat experimental, and they appear to have failed miserably. Today, the state ranks near the bottom nationally, 45th in literacy and 44th in performance on standard achievement tests. Yet Bill Clinton defends even the most radical of his policies. He argues that he has not failed, but succeeded, raising the question, just what is Bill Clinton's idea of educational success? Mark Lowry is the former director for Governor's School Publicity. I think the whole intent of the Governor's School in taking 350 to 400 students per summer is to, they're getting the best and the brightest students in the state of Arkansas and they're trying to pick out I think those four or five or six exceptional students that could be future political leaders and then to mold their minds in this more liberal humanistic thinking and it's uh, the six-week program really uh, amounts I think to, to mental hazing. How can I say this? Um, they were, um, Hillary Clinton for instance talked about converting the schools into something similar to governor's school Rather than students uh, learning how much two and two equals, they would be asked what they feel about two plus two. Uh, right now we have a move going on in, in our Arkansas schools called restructuring, where they are trying to move away from uh, more objective, substantive learning into this subjective area of feelings and, uh, and, and I think ultimately political correctness. If parents were told that their student was going to be brought to a cloistered environment, here at, uh, at Hendricks College. And if, if those parents were told that their child was gonna be brainwashed, they wouldn't let their, their child go. But they need to know that that is exactly what's happening. The greatest influence of the governor's school is to promote the thought with these st students that to be intellectual, to be considered intellectual by your peers, whether it is in the area of math, science, language arts, or even music, to really be a true intellectual, you have to be a liberal thinker. And that liberal thinking not only takes in philosophy, it also takes in political thought. And that is the underlying message that, that goes, that permeates the whole six weeks of what I would call not teaching or learning, but indoctrination. The manipulation would give, even go so far as to um, as just out and out trickery. Uh, I was allowed several years after I was not at the governor's school anymore to still come back and visit it w with some of the faculty uh, and went to the faculty lounge, which is one of the, the areas where they compare notes. The area one, two, and three instructors get together and they say, well, this is what I'm doing here. Oh, good, well, that's going to dovetail well with what I'm doing in this area. And yeah, that's going to work good in area three, too. And one professor, uh, once he was a professor in college, but he was also teaching at the governor's school. He came in one day and he was just slapping his leg. He was just so happy. He said, it worked, it worked. The other instructor said, what are you talking about? What worked? And he said, ever since I walked into my class, with a Bible under my arm and set it down on the table, they haven't dared challenge anything that I said. And the others started getting a big hoot out of that and laughing about it and saying, well, we might ought to start doing it too. That, I mean, I was amazed. I never came back again after that because I realized then that it wasn't just something that hap just happened to be going on out here. It, ha it was something that was well orchestrated, it was well organized, and it was mind-bending and manipulative and the faculty all knew that it was going on. You can imagine taking the best, the cream of the crop, and taking those people that are gonna be the leaders in our next generation, and pushing in them the values that Governor Clinton has, that the, that the leftist media has, that the, the values that go totally against what this nation were founded on. And that's, that's what I, I was exposed to. There wasn't any warning. There wasn't anyone that said, okay, now you're going to have to take and put all your, your values that you grew up with and put them on the shelf and, and be exposed to this. 
If my, if my parents had known what was going on there, they wouldn't have let me go. So it tears down their authority figure uh, system, and then they help establish another one. And the authority figure that they establish in their life is the student himself. Ellen Gilchrist, who is a renowned writer, spoke to the students, and she was quoted as saying, students, totally, do me a favor, totally ignore your parents. Listen to them, but then forget them because you need to start using your own stuff, your real stuff that you have. That is not just an isolated incident of one speaker coming in and saying that. That is the message that, that comes through the Area 2 classes. It comes through the Area 3 classes. Uh, it's, there's really absolute collusion throughout the whole six weeks. The films, the Area 1, Area 2, Area 3, the recreational activities, the, the music that the students learn, the drama presentations, all of those are done to try and help develop a, a belief that there are no absolutes. It's okay to challenge authority because you are part of an elite and you have that right to challenge that authority. They convince the students that you are elite. The reason that you're not going to be understood when you go home, you're not going to be understood by your parents, your friends, your pastor, anybody, is because you have been treated to, to, to thought that they can't handle. But it's really here. This intellectual elitism, this cultural elitism, gives them the right to make decisions whether the people want them or not. Because then it gives them the right to be able to say, we know better than you. The more people learn about the activist agenda of governor's school, the more they see the connections to the governmental and civic process. They're beginning to realize that if they don't involve themselves, schools like governor's school will proliferate. It appears that Governor's School has taught America a valuable lesson after all. The next time you turn on your television and you hear Bill Clinton tell you how great Goals 2000 is, remember the Governor's School in Arkansas was his dream come true. I'd like to talk to you now about Bill Spady. He's often referred to as the father of outcome-based education. He advocates group learning, elimination of grades, and sees no particular reason for books in the classroom. He says we must teach our children to think globally and that we should have school the year round. Meet Bill Spady. Channel 4 News of Oklahoma City did a special report on outcome-based education called What Did You Learn in School Today? In a personal interview with Bill Spady, Jana Davis of Channel 4 News asked Mr. Spady this question. Where does patriotism and nationalism fit into this equation? Mr. Spady replied, I don't know. Ms. Davis then asked, do you think a child needs to learn to feel patriotic about his country? Is that important? Mr. Spady's answer was, I think children, well, well, I don't know what patriotism means. The woman you're about to see certainly has the credentials to tell us about education. In 1980, Charlotte Isserby was a member of Ronald Reagan's transitional team in the U.S. Department of Education. In 1981 and 82, she served as a senior policy advisor at the U.S. Department of Education in the Office of Educational Research Improvement from which all restructuring efforts emanated. Since then, Charlotte has served as educational consultant, lectured across the U.S., and written a book. In 1994, Charlotte joined three other educational experts in Vail, Colorado for a roundtable discussion. I want you to listen closely to what Charlotte has to say. She has seen these changes from the top down. Outcome-based education isn't anything more, really, than a socialist system of, of education, where the government determines what the students should learn, how the teachers should be trained, etc. That's right. right. Well, how long has this been underway, this type of a project? Well, it's been underway for a long time. Basically, it's, it started uh, in the early 1900s with the Carnegie Corporation uh, 
changing the social studies. I have a very interesting book called Recommendations um, and Conclusions on the Social Studies <coughs> that Carnegie funded with the American Historical Association. Mm -hmm. And in that book, they come right out and they mention New World Order and they mention uh, collective, the need to change from the free market system to collectivism. So you follow through with that book that basically changed our social studies. So many parents out there are listening or begin, uh, have wondered why we didn't focus on the American uh, system uh, of government, free market and individualism and all, and they never really understood that this has been in the works ever mm -hmm. since the early 1900s. And then you move on to the, uh, when the United States went into the United Nations in 1945, and the creation of the United Nations Educational Scientific Cultural Organization, UNESCO. And then in 19, uh, then you jump a bit, where the United States Office of Education was funding a lot of very uh, controversial programs, even prior to 1965. That was the key year, however, when the decision was made by the top uh, internationalists. And don't forget, the same thing was going on in other countries, not just the mm -hmm. United States. The decision was made to focus on uh, changing children's attitudes and values uh, to prepare them for what uh, Bert, was, Bert was, mm -hmm. just, uh, was just talking about. And the way they did that was through massive amounts of money going into the schools under the title of equity, basically. And they sold it to the American people because we are concerned about minorities. We are concerned about the poor. And uh, they poured just billions in. And with the billions, they had to set up an accountability system. But when you say equity, what, what are you talking equity about? Equity to bring the schools to the point where the for the minorities and all that, they would have the same opportunities that our children had in schools that were spending more on education or focusing more on academics. That's what they said, that they were going to do this for the minorities. Well, in, in fact, what they did was they poured the money into experimental programs, uh, all of which, with the exception of the open classroom, which was also experimental, but they, they, there were two divisions. The experimental programs dealt with the changing of attitudes, values, and beliefs in the open classroom. It also dealt with, and, and doing away with the focus on academics, it also dealt with the use of mastery learning, which is now called outcomes-based education based on behavioral psycho psychologist uh, B.F. Skinner from Harvard, you know, who said, I could make a pigeon a high achiever by reinforcing it on a proper schedule. And parents have got to understand that is OBE. They used the minorities. They, they, they spent millions of dollars every, according to uh, James Block, who is a very, Professor James mm -hmm. Block, a close associate of William Spadey's and John Champlin's, et cetera. He said, I don't know of a single inner city school in this country that hasn't used mastery learning. So there we see the deliberate dumb down of our minority children. When it worked on them, and we have the, the uh, mm -hmm. most recent uh, evaluation of these programs, plus the infamous 1984 Spady grant that put it into every classroom in the nation, we have the evaluations that show that it would be very difficult to replicate to put these programs into the schools of America. They're not at all sure that they work. Academically. But they can academically. academically. But the point is that they continued on because, as, as uh, Chen Yuhat said, they're not interested in academics. They're interested in what Skinner said, what is reinforced will be repeated. Rewards to children every time that they do something right. Every time, and the, the computer is superb with this. They used to, they, you, they've done it with candies and this and that, and it's totally approved by the, the United States Department of Education, the use of rewards. So here we are. In 1994, the reauthorizing the Elementary and Secondary Education Act again, the act that, in effect, in 65, put the account accountability mechanism in. If you don't reach the goal, the politically correct attitude set by the government, predetermined, and forget the academics because they're not important anymore, if you don't reach that goal, your school could well be shut down and taken over. You won't get your money. Any smart school that decides not to take money from the federal government right now, and they would be smart if they did it, will find themselves in a lot of trouble. But that's the accountability mechanism. 
you accomplish what the federal government, which is actually the United Nations Educational Scientific mm -hmm. Cultural right. Organization, has set as the goal for every child on this planet. Mm -hmm. and they will all use mastery learning. Professor Alan Cohen at the University of San Francisco, ca I, I went through a course of his, he's a close associate of Spady's, chaplain and all, he said that UNESCO 20 years ago determined that OBE, mastery learning, would be the learning system for the world. You were quoting last night the, the favorite lie that um, every parent has heard when they try to get involved in the school. What is it? It's that you're the only parent that has a problem. Even when you that know that, a, right? Even when you know that a hundred other parents yeah. are complaining That's about right. the very same thing. That's what you're told. Well, you That's know, this right. has been going on a long time because this is when I originally got, came back to the United States and I went over and they, they had this uh, new uh, textbook that uh, John Goodlad, the the very famous educator who is involved in changing all of our schools, and he's an internationalist. He recommends this uh, ten years later, and I saw it in 1972. And it was called World of Mankind by Follett. And uh, I looked at it, and uh, I, I was very upset because they, it had the elementary school teachers taking the little kids through the town and identifying rich and poor families. You know, they'd say, who do you think lives in that big house, right? Big mm -hmm. colonial mm -hmm. house in Camden, Maine. And is that, fa that family is a very rich family, yes. And then they'd say, and across the street, what kind of a family lives there? And the kids would say, oh, I guess quite poor in a mobile home. What do you think they eat in that house? I thought, what is this? You know, and so I went in and I said, I don't like this. What are you doing to these little children? They all get along just fine if you leave them alone. They don't care whether they're rich and poor. And so uh, the principal said to me, oh, Charlotte, uh, they'd already started calling us by our first names, right? Not mm -hmm. Mrs. Cesarbeta, but that was the time when we all call each other by our first names. We started then. Uh, Charlotte, uh, you're the only parent who's ever complained. And I thought, I said, I don't care whether I'm the only parent who's ever complained. And I went to the school board and, and uh, I, I discussed it. And of course, they all said I was wrong. And, and I went on, for, and then finally, uh, I was so concerned about the whole thing, I took a course in how to become a change agent. And uh, a teacher came down to my house one day and said, Charlotte, I really think that you should go to this uh, in-service training. This was a retired teacher. Mm -hmm. And I said, how much does it cost? She said, oh, it's $100. I said, I can't afford it. And she said, here's $100. And so she gave it to me, and I went. And I couldn't understand. There were all these teachers and principals there. And they were talking about identifying resistors in the community and how to get sex ed in and how to get critical thinking in and how, do I, how to, to, to locate the people in the community, like in the Rotary and the people that are the best, you know, highly thought of good people in our communities, how to use them to fight us. With our money. And with our money. And I went through this course, which was funded by my, subsequently, I went to work for the U.S. Department of Education. My office funded Ronald Havelock out of the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, to put this big change guide to change a for change agents. Mm -hmm. It's been used all over the United States for 20 years on how to put these programs in that all those parents out there who are listening to this right now, that they've been cl complaining about, they've been told they're crazy probably because they're like, no, they're, you're not crazy parents. You're not crazy. You, you believe in the rights of the individual. You have your own values. You believe it's up to you to determine the values of your children. These people are purposely, they know what they're doing. They, they poured millions of dollars into destroying mm -hmm. our children's values and changing our children's thinking so that they will be comfortable living in a controlled world government. Now that is when I woke up. You can imagine when I woke up, when I found out that I, I was being taught how to identify myself in a free, so what I thought was a free society. Mm -hmm. and that blew my mind. Yeah. You know, Benjamin Bloom calls that a peak learning experience. Yes. Talk about Benjamin Bloom. Look, Benjamin Bloom. Bloom. Change agents were the people that were installed. And the reason I'm saying this yes. is that a lot of teachers who are going to hear what you just said are going to go, well, I work in the public school system and I don't do that. But they've been duped into, oh, yes. into this. And change agents were the people trained yeah. to do this. And I was being trained. Right. I couldn't go back the second mm -hmm. session. It was so sickening. But what we have to remember is this, because we're talking about Benjamin Bloom. We mentioned him before. He is the father of mastery learning. 
at, which is based on pigeon training. Mm -hmm. But Benjamin Bloom said, and you have to remember this, he was very involved in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and Bert is a real expert on his taxonomy. She's going to discuss this next. He said, the purpose of education is to change the thoughts, actions, and feelings of students and to make them get them to discuss issues. And he said he defined good teaching as challenging the students' fixed beliefs. Now, when you, when, if you understand that, you understand the training I went through to be a change agent. Right. Because that would enable our communities to have access to all of these mind-bending, federally funded programs like the New Model Me mm -hmm. and Positive Attitude Toward Learning coming out of my old office Every state has offices in them under the National Diffusion Network. That network was used basically for attitude and value change. Mammoth amounts of money. So that's I, I it. Think it in this floating scheme of things, how mm -hmm. do we get to right or wrong? Because obviously now you can have a world of uh, moral chaos. It has to be purely arbitrary. It has to be it a dictatorship to, at the yeah. top. Well, you know, could I, this thing from mm -hmm. Eugene, Oregon, Yes, it's important. This is Education 2000. And we're talking about, what we're talking about basically is a deliberate dumbing down. Because the less people know, the less likely they are to question. I mean, it, it, that's mm -hmm. always been the case. But this is really, I, I've just looked at this the other day, I've had it for quite a while. It says at the end, with the former curriculum, mm -hmm. elementary students were expected to master 2,175 separate bits of information that included skills, concepts, and content organized within eight discrete disciplines. The new K through 5 Education 2000 curriculum requires mastery of only six major themes, 60 concepts, and 132 core skills organized within three curriculum strands. This revision greatly reduces the fragmented nature of the former curriculum and significantly decreases the number of specific requirements to approximately, and parents listen out there, one tenth the original number. So what they have done is they have the elitists at the top, the Bill Spadies, the et cetera, the transformational types. They are determining the tenth of the whole that your children, our children, are going to have mm -hmm. to learn. Now, they have said all along that facts don't make any difference anymore because there's so much out there. Right. There's so much mm -hmm. out there. The information society is exploding. So children shouldn't really have to learn anything. That's their justification. That's their justification for this. Here is a report card. I mean, this is the Effective School Report, mm -hmm. 1994. Mm -hmm. It's called Alternative Assessment of Student Achievement, the Open Book Test. Wouldn't we have loved that? I would have loved it if when I had to take a test back 20, 25 years ago, the teacher had said, you don't have to learn anything, Charlotte. I'm not, don't worry, you don't go out and play. I'm going to give you the book when you take the test. Here it is. The op all classroom tests should be open book tests. What you were talking about. We are moving toward higher level thinking and away from memorization of facts. Once we leave school, we can use references anytime we want. We're no longer required to memorize endless lists of facts. Don't forget, this is effective school research, which is the key. That's where OBE effective. comes from. No, effective. EFF. -F. Oh, okay. Effective school right. research is what OBE is based on internationally. Effective. EFF. -F. So you have to remember that. Very, that's very important. Uh, of course, they use affective mm -hmm. methods. But we're no longer required. Okay, open book tests will move school activities much closer to real life activities. The, now, this is the key. The human brain should be used for processing. Just what you were talking about. Not storage. This will cause classroom tests to be constructed to measure critical thinking induction, deduction, analysis, synthesis, Bert was talking about. This is the proof of what she's talking about. This mm -hmm. is 1994. This is the educator's journal. You know, I'm not meant to get it, but I've been getting it for 10 years. They wish they keep dropping me off the list. They wish I wouldn't keep getting it. <laughs> OK. Since critical thinking is what will be measured, critical thinking is what will be taught. But critical thinking does, is not logic and no, reason. absolutely no, not. By their, by their definition. No. No. By Which the, is what by I was trying to say right. earlier. So this is the proof right here of what Bert's yes. saying and what Genuvet has said. And I think it's, again, we need to remind ourselves what true education does. True education should expand all the faculties of the mind. Which right. are? 
at which are memory, right. conscience, uh, imagination, insight, intuition, and the brain. Right. And when you pros just process information, you denied, cut off those Absolutely. other functions of the mind Absolutely. and reduce it to the brain alone, which is just right. simply processing the information. And the, the um, danger, of course, of that is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, uh, and keeps rippling on and on. Because they have no way, in later in life, they have no, no way of filtering no. what right. they're hearing That's and right. become subject right. to the latest. And, and uh, I believe it was Columbia Teachers College in the late 70s had a symposium on knowing how we come to know things and how important this is. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that uh, looked at this and said that much of what they were doing in education was denying these other functions of the mind and reducing them to the brain alone. And they reminded us that it is uh, the other functions, memory, um, insight, intuition, conscience, imagination, by which we know absolutes right. and truths. Let's just make it very simple language. Education was to help the individual child mm -hmm. become competent and to mm -hmm. be able to move forward in whatever he wanted to do. Achieve his right? potential. Achieve his. Mm -hmm. It is now education is for the benefit of the state. That's right. The children are nothing but human resources to be used, to be molded, to be recycled, mm -hmm. to come to the, the predetermined mm -hmm attitude value they're creating a new man some people have called it the new soviet man because basically that's what we're looking at we're really looking at a a soviet system of education but there's no difference we've gone through the even 1992 russian curriculum it's exactly the same as ours ours with site-based management uh community service uh, mastery learning, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. cooperative learning, mm -hmm. critical thinking, which is Lenin. Mm -hmm. We are putting in, sorry folks, I know, communism's dead, so we call it something else, don't we? We're putting in the Russian education system. But we've been doing it since 1959 when Dwight Eisenhower signed the first agreement with the Soviet Union. To do that. To do that. Right. And at the peak of the Cold War, which is the most interesting part of it, why would we do that? And then you can thank President Carter for having broken those agreements when they moved into Afghanistan, but then Pro Ronald Reagan came along and re-signed signed them again and allowed the Soviets to come right into our classrooms to work with our teachers, our professors at Harvard, to develop higher order critical thinking curriculum for the computer, what, what Bert's talking about in the area of social sciences, war, peace, etc. They're sitting down there in Cambridge right now with the, with the Russians developing these programs for our schools. That happened under Ronald Reagan. We never had them really developing curriculum until then. Mm -hmm. I have a study from the Northwest Regional Laboratory in Portland, Oregon uh, on effective, E-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E, -E, effective school research. And it says right in there that mastery learning slows down the bright kids. These are their own words. So I wanted to follow that up with that absolute proof that if people want it, we can give it to them. Yeah, but is the argument over and we hear this now, what the outcomes are, or is the argument over the whole system? Uh, I'd like to get into that one, because we've had bad outcomes, I think, for a long time. I mean, 20 years ago, I remember fighting health education in Maine, where there was a, one of the outcomes on the health ed for seventh graders was uh, knowing the four different types of sexual intercourse. And I became very upset about that. That's a bad outcome, right? <laughs> And so it's not outcomes. And as long as we discuss outcomes, those people at the top, and the, the NEA bicentennial was a fascinating time. That was in 1976, when the cardinal principles of the NEA were rewritten with David Rockefeller, Benjamin Bloom, Ralph Tyler, Theodore Sizer, all of these people involved in OBE. And uh, the, point, the point right here is that those outcomes, uh, as, as bad as they, as they are, have been the goals of the NEA for a long time. Mm -hmm. But the people involved at the top, it's business, international businessmen and all, like David Rockefeller, mm -hmm. et cetera, mm -hmm. are working with people that you would never believe, like Benjamin Bloom. So they approve of the system, and the system is mastery learning, mm -hmm. and it has been defined as the system for international work, Force training. Uh, I have come to the conclusion now they have no no concerns whatsoever about academic education, uh, e except as it relates possibly to the identification of the child in second grade, 
what job that child will have in the global economy. And now they're doing all sorts of shadowing, taking them into nursing homes and everything else, identifying where the child should go in the future for the good of a global economy. They will not educate that child in the traditional way that we've all been accustomed to. They will educate them uh, in the way, as I pointed out, with the Oregon mm -hmm. thing, where you're down to one-tenth of what you learned before. So the child who's going to be a mechanic or a ballet dancer or whatever else will be narrowly tracked through and only those things that uh, pertain to the child's future in the global economy for the global economy will be dealt with and mastery learning is the only form mm -hmm. of education using Skinner because Skinner mm -hmm. says what is uh, reinforced will be repeated mm -hmm. that is the only way to get all of our children all over the world to perform according to the what David Rockefeller mm -hmm. Theodore Sizer, Benjamin Blumen, all on the cardinal principles. It's unbelievable to see who has jumped in bed together. The top internationalists and the NEA. And it's the global economy we're looking at. Let's not think of anything else. It's only money. You get down, boom, mm -hmm. it's the dollar sign or the mark or the fennec or the Japanese yen. That's what they're looking for. It's always been that. So why would people say this is unusual? This the whole education system really is being geared for the workplace. Common unity. Yeah. That's what Bert was saying. Uh, we will be totally controlled in our communities. And this is where uh, Jenny Vett is so superb. And Anita, when she brings in, we're not talking about education today, folks. We're talking about the whole thing. Total control in our communities mm -hmm. being watched very carefully with block captains. They're going to have this advisory councils. Mm -hmm. I looked it up in the dictionary, Webster's, mm -hmm. the other day. Council, Soviet. It says it right in there. A council is a Soviet. This is what's being set in. Unelected officials, site-based management. They're doing away with school boards. Mm -hmm. They don't want anybody who's been elected. They're going to appoint the people that they want. What mm -hmm. does this sound like, folks? You can call it what you want. Often I say that. I don't want to put a label on it. You name it out there. You name what a system that has unelected officials running it. Mm -hmm. and, and has uh, five-year plans in place and deals and goes into the home to see if you're bringing up your children correctly. You put the label on that system, what not I. New American Schools Development Corporation, Charlotte. A OBE is everywhere, right? Yes, OBE will be everywhere, including private schools and homeschoolers. Uh, we know that because of the uh, legislation that's being passed in various states like Minnesota and Michigan where they're passing legislation to create OBE charter schools. And it's unbelievable that homeschoolers are falling mm -hmm. for this. They're, 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 they're getting involved in setting up charter schools. They've been fighting OBE. They took their kids out of the public school system to get away from OBE. And now they're jumping on the OBE charter school bandwagon. Now, charter schools, yeah, we have to understand this. It's not just charter schools that are, are the new American School Development Corporation. But basically, this is a corporation that was set up under President Bush. And it's been planned. Everything that we've talked about today has been planned for a good 30 years, including getting rid of school boards. I have an old site-based management paper mm -hmm. from the Aspen Institute. It's 20 years yeah. old on how to get rid of school boards. So everything that we're talking about today, for everybody out there, don't think anything is new. It's all been planned. But anyway, getting back to the New American School Development Corporation, a private corporation, privately funded, unbelievable. I don't believe in partnerships with the public sector. There is no accountability whatsoever. If a corporation comes into a school or takes a child on the job, something happens to that child, he, he cuts his finger off, who is accountable? If the school board isn't going to be there, charter schools will have no school boards. They will be carefully selected people running them. They will be probably private sector, but will be paid for with tax money. Now, the New American School Development Corporation was referred to by the very people who put it in. You know, it's been about four years now. Uh, there was no public bidding for this. All of the designs were predetermined, like Theodore Sizer's mm -hmm. Coalition for Essential Schools and all the various ones, the Minnesota Learning Labs or whatever, the community this, the Yale, Professor Ziegler, all of them had done their work long before President Bush even mentioned them. They submitted their bids. They were selected. I think there were originally 11, and there are now nine mm -hmm. going into the second phase. Uh, every, I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, every school, every congressional district will have one of these in place mm -hmm. by next year, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then that will be the prototype 
for all schools in the nation to follow. The purpose of this, it goes from workforce training to school-based clinics, lifelong learning, mandated community services is something that we have not discussed yet. Community service is very important, just like in the Soviet Union, community service. Uh, it's unconstitutional. Indentured servitude. Yes, it is. It's right. totally unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. People aren't making much of it now because they're making excuses saying, oh, it's just in school and kids should learn how to be good to one another and go out and help. And all. No, but all of us are going to have to perform community mm -hmm. service in this new society. But the, these schools, the New American School Development Corporation, and for those who are listening, we have all of the, we have all of the reports on each particular school. Uh, one of them, fortunately, was uh, enough opposition in North Carolina, the Odyssey Project. We did manage to get rid of that. And I know I love to point out that that had three-year-olds doing community service. Not third graders, three-year-olds. Now, this is the focus. It's total socialism, total socialism. They were taking three-year-olds into nursing. They were going to do that into nursing homes. Get the feeling of uh, my good is of no importance. I am working for the group. I'm working for the collective. Right. All of these new American school development corporations. The philosophy that runs straight through is the OBE, no Carnegie units, mastery learning. Everything we've talked about today is used in each one of them. Although each one of the design teams is different. And uh, Americans are going to just blow their minds in a couple of years when they wake up and they think, hey, yeah, what happened to my school? And then we're going to say, where were you? Why, you, why didn't you listen? 10 o'clock in the morning. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> so the point, though, again, we get back is to the, to the workforce. And as uh, we've said before, we've, we've, they've set up the Secretary's Commission on Achieving Necessary Skills. Those are the skills our children will have to demonstrate they're capable of doing before they get a certificate of mastery and they move on. And all of us, including myself, I'm getting a little old for the workforce. But anyway, anybody in the 40s or 50s loses their job, they're going to have to go through that. Now, you have to remember that the Thomas Sticht, who is on the Secretary's Commission for Achieving Necessary Skills, he and William Spady, so very famous uh, on the international outcome-based education, whatever he has there, those two put OBE into the District of Columbia in 1978. Mm -hmm. Mastery learning. Very interesting. Ten years later, Stick says, it's not important whether the children can read or write. He said, what's important is that they're manageable and trainable and that we can change their values. This is a direct quote from the Washington Post. I went in the Department of Education. Our office dealt with learning technology. Mm -hmm. And a very fine career officer took me through and showed me computer software. And I said, hey, that's great. Uh, you could teach your children at home with that. This was the number one man in the Office of Library and Learning Technology. And he said, Charlotte, that's the way it will be. Mm -hmm. The learning will, this was 14 years ago, the learning will go on at home, but you will always have the schools mm -hmm. for socialization. And he said that, and I thought, hmm. And since recently, I've been thinking, wow, that's just where we're at right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. They're going to allow homeschooling, actually. They're, they're going to back off a bit, but they're going to have the goals. They're going to have to get the goals, and they're going to take mm -hmm. those children for part of the day, and they're going to have them over in the school doing all the cooperative mm -hmm. learning, all the critical thinking, all the stuff that they have to do. And, and that's exactly where we're at now. If you're very talented and they see tremendous possibility for a child in fifth grade for engineering or something, wow. Like in the Soviet Union, like with magnet schools, they will, they will put a big price tag on that kid. And he'll go right through, and he'll be the top. The money will follow the child. I want to thank Charlotte Isserby for speaking out. I only wish we had more in the Department of Education that would do the same. Next, I would like you to meet Sam Blumenfeld. I don't know anyone whose opinions and writings in education are more respected than his. Mr. Blumenfeld is an educator, lecturer, and the author of seven books, six of them on education. He has a monthly newsletter, the Blumenfeld Education Letter, which keeps you updated on the latest happenings in education. He also has written many articles for major newspapers and magazines. For a list of everything he has available, call the number at the bottom of your screen and his office will be happy to send it to you. Mr. Blumenfeld has done a tremendous amount of research on our children's decline in their reading abilities. He gave a lecture in Stockton, California on this subject. 
It was filmed by American Opinion Speakers Bureau, and I found it very informative. I feel certain you will too. John Dewey worked in his laboratory school at the University of Chicago for over two years, creating a new curriculum for the schools of America. And he wrote a book in which all of his ideas were plainly stated, a book entitled School and Society, which to this day is probably read, which is pro it is probably required reading uh, by every American uh, teacher who goes to a teacher's college. It's probably one of the books on the required reading list because John Dewey and his book, School and Society, really outline the curriculum we have today. Well, what was John Dewey's curriculum? He said, we have got to downgrade the literacy skills. We've got to downgrade the academic skills. And we've got to emphasize the social skills. You see, if you want children to become socialists, they've got to be uh, engaged in activities, uh, group uh, work, values, if you're going to change their minds, social studies. He says that's where the emphasis has got to be. We've got to de-emphasize linguistic language skills. Why? Because Dewey considered high literacy to be an obstacle to socialism. An obstacle to socialism? Well, because what did high literacy produce? It produced these highly uh, individualistic Americans who could read for themselves, this individual intelligence that could stand on its own feet, that could judge right from wrong, and did not need the advice of an elite. You see, if you're highly literate, you feel pretty confident in your own ability to judge the world, to judge things, to make up your own mind about things. And he said, this was not conducive to collectivist control. If you have all of these individualists, they're not going to be easily manipulated. It's very hard to manipulate somebody who is, uh, can think for himself. You see, you really can't think for yourself until you have a high degree of literacy. Because what does high, li li high literacy consist of? It consists of knowing language so well that you really have a full command of the tool of thought. Because what, how do we think? We think in terms of language. Language is the tool of thought. Vocabulary. If you don't have a vocabulary that includes concepts, for example, of freedom, unalienable rights, you're not going to know anything about them, are you? So our vocabulary gives us the means of thinking. Now, in a socialist society, you have an elite at the top that rules over a dumbed-down or malleable mass. And so they decided they, they, they had to put their, their minds to work. They said, look, we've got to give the American people the impression that we are educating their children while at the same time dumbing them down. How are we going to do that? Bit of a problem. But these were the world's leading psychologists. These were men who had done all of their experiments on animals. Edward L. Thorndike thought he could learn a lot about how children learn by studying chickens. And he became the leading exponent of educational psychology. He was the one who developed the, stimu the stimulus response technique, which is used to this day, stimulus response. You read today's uh, curricula put out by your State Departments of Education, they talk about all the stimuli. Now, when you teach a child at home, do you say, I'm going to give you stimuli? Let's give Johnny stimuli today. But the schools talk all about stimuli, response. Thorndike actually preceded Pavlov, and Pavlov says that he owes a great deal to Thorndike who really started this whole business of conditioning. Well, Thorndike did his experiments on chickens. Pavlov did his experiments with dogs. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Pavlov 
dog, the salivating, the conditioned salivating dogs, the conditioning techniques. Uh, John B. Watson did his experiments with rats. And Skinner, B.F. Skinner, of course, continued to do his experiments with rats. You see, B.F. Skinner doesn't believe that there's much of a difference between a rat and a human being. Of course, there may not be much of a difference between B.F. Skinner and a rat. <laughs> but I think there is a considerable difference between human beings and rats. In any case, these men, they had their plan. They knew what to do. We will change the way reading is taught in American schools. We will teach children to read English as if it were an ideographic writing system like Chinese. Now, did they know that that method would destroy literacy? Of course they did. They discussed it. They admitted it, that it would, that it would turn children into word guesses, guessers. They even did studies on how could children learn to read by this method. And it's like the joke about where does an elephant, uh, where does a a gorilla sleep wherever he wants to. Well, how does a children learn uh, to recognize words by the whole word method? Which, in whatever way he can. They knew that. You see, they knew that then. Incidentally, we use ideographs and pictographs today a great deal. If you notice, because of the declining literacy in America, more and more ideographs and pictographs are being used. For example, you go to an international airport, or you don't even have to go to an airport, in lots of hotels, if you want to go to the washroom, you have to look for the little picture of the person in pants if you're a male, or you go to the door with the picture of a, somebody in a dress. But of course, some women wear pants and they may go into the wrong room. It's much more precise if it says men on the door and ladies on the other door, but that's one of the hazards of pictography, is the imprecision. It's a very imprecise way of teaching reading. Because language is used to interpret pictographs and ideographs. An example, you know the typical ideograph of the cigarette in the circle with the slash through it. What does it mean? No smoking. It also means thou shalt not smoke. It also means défense de fumer. It means no fumar. It means you may not smoke. In other words, the language is used to interpret the little picture. And we're using more and more of those little pictures and ideographs all the time. The other day, or a couple of months ago in North Carolina, we were driving along the road and there was a sign, a circle with a question mark in it. And I asked myself, what in blazes does that mean? <laughs> does it mean, uh, do you know where you're going? But then I noticed that there was a little arrow underneath that sign, on the, under that sign, pointing to the left. So I looked to the left quickly and saw an information booth. You see, that's, what inform that's how they designate information now, with a question mark in a circle. In most places, they will have the ideograph, the idiot graph, with, with alphabetic writing to make sure that you you know, that you don't misinterpret it. Uh, and uh, that helps. But I finally found an airport where they had no alphabetic writing at all, all ideographs, believe it or not. And this was at the Little Rock, Arkansas airport. I could not believe it. But when I wanted to go to the baggage claim, I had to look for the little picture of the suitcase and follow that, just follow the suitcase. And then I noticed that when I was uh, being taken uh, back to the airport, I noticed that there were two signs. For departures, they had a picture of an airplane going this way, upward. And for arrivals, they had a picture of an airplane going this way. <laughs> you got to really think fast, you know, when you're driving and you're saying, where, where do I go? Is it going up, down? What, what is it? You know, what does it mean? But we are being trained, we are being prepared for a new form of writing to be used extensively by a dumbed down population that can't handle alphabetic writing anymore. That can only deal with little pictures. 
You can't do much thinking with a bunch of little pictures. But this is a planned thing. What I'm telling you is just as the new method of teaching reading was not devised by some little old lady living in a mobile home in Florida, neither are all these pictographs devised by some recluse somewhere. Th these things are being done by the world's top designers working in concert with others. In any case, these men devised this new way of teaching reading that would indeed lower literacy. And they weren't ready to get it into the schools until, the, uh, until 1930. Now, why did it take that long? Here was John Dewey saying in 1903 and 4, as far back as 1898, that we've got to do something about literacy. But they had to wait until 1930. Why? Because it took that long for the progressive educators who had fanned out from Teachers College Columbia uh, and the University of Chicago, had fanned out all over the United States to the graduate schools of education, had attained high positions, sometimes as presidents of universities, and had trained a sufficient number of superintendents so that then they could be placed in all of the school districts of America, or in most of them. The superintendents were heavily indoctrinated by the progressives because every year they had their convention, and I've gone through the entire record. I've, I, I, I've read the speeches given at these conventions in the 1920s and the 1930s, and these superintendents were bombarded with an endless indo indoctrination on the glories and beauties of socialism. And so by the time 1930 came around, the professors had already created the books that were ready to put, be put in the schools. And the books uh, that were ready were the Dick and Jane readers, produced by William Scott Gray at the University of Chicago, who was the protege of Charles Judd, who had studied at Leipzig and who was the dean. And the reading books by Arthur I. Gates at Teachers College Columbia, who had been taught by Edward L. Thorndike. He was Thorndike's protege. So this stuff was coming from the very highest levels of American education. Now it just so happens that in 1929, the professors were warned that their new teaching method would indeed cause reading problems. Who warned them? Well, the person who warned them was Dr. Samuel T. Orton, a neuropathologist at the University of Iowa who had been dealing with children with reading problems. You see, they had, they had tried out the method experimentally in different places to see how well it worked. And Dr. Orton was dealing with all of these kids with reading problems, and he found out that the genesis of their problem was this new sight reading method. And so he wrote an article that was published in the February 1929 issue of the Journal of Educational Psychology. This was the title of the article. The Sight Reading Method of Teaching Reading as a Source of Reading Disability. See, they knew about it in 1929. And this is what he said, Dr. Orton said. I wish to emphasize at the beginning that the strictures which I have to offer here do not apply to the use of the sight method of teaching reading as a whole, but only to its effects on a restricted group of children for whom, as I think we can show, this technique is not only not adapted, but often proves an actual obstacle to reading progress. And moreover, I believe that this group is one of considerable size. Well, he was dealing with a very small sample, but we know today that it's about one-third of the student population. One-third. That's a lot of students, one-third. And because here, faulty teaching methods may not only prevent the acquisition of academic education by children of average capacity, but may also give rise to far-reaching damage to their emotional life. Well, you couldn't be clearer than that. Now, you might say, well, maybe the professors did not 
read this uh, article. Well, they had to read it because it was published in their own magazine. The Journal of Educational Psychology was the only such journal in the United States, and it was being edited by the very professors who were creating these new teaching techniques. Well, what did they think about Dr. Orton's article? Why did they publish it? Well, I believe they published it because it confirmed to them what they wanted to know, that the method indeed would do what the professors wanted it to do. Well, maybe Dr. Orton was, wasn't very important. Maybe he was just a young doctor who didn't know very much. But Dr. Samuel T. Orton went on to become the world's leading expert on dyslexia. The world's leading expert. In fact, there's an organization named after him today called the Orton Dyslexia Society, which deals with the reading problems. He identified them. Now, if a supposing a drug firm was on the eve of putting out a new drug, issuing a new drug, and they were warned by a distinguished physician that this drug would have deleterious effects on many of its users. Do you think that that drug firm in its right mind would proceed to put that drug on the market? I think they would have second thoughts. Now here was a, prof here was a doctor, a, a medical doctor telling these professors that this new teaching method would have harmful effects on a large, a considerable number of youngsters and they went ahead and put it in the schools. Well, of course, it didn't take very long before the harmful effects became pretty obvious to the American people. As a matter of fact, in April of 1944, Life magazine uh, published a lead article on dyslexia. By then, it had become a household word, by 1944. Prior to 1930, nobody had ever heard of dyslexia. And all you have to do is go through the, the periodical guide, uh, the guide to periodical literature, educational literature, and try to find dyslexia in the index prior to this period. You won't find it. It didn't exist. The disease didn't exist. But this is what they wrote in 1944 about dyslexia. Life magazine. Millions of children in the U.S. suffer from dyslexia, which is the medical term for reading difficulties. It is responsible for about 70% of the school failures in the 6 to 12 year old age group and handicaps about 15% of all grade school children. Dyslexia may stem from a variety of physical ailments or combination of them. You see, the editors obviously went to the uh, professors and asked them, well, what is causing all this dyslexia? What's causing the problem? Well, this, these are the, the causes that the uh, professors gave. They said uh, it is caused by uh, glandular imbalance, heart disease, eye or ear trouble, or from a deep-seated psychological disturbance that blocks a child's ability to learn. Isn't that interesting? Heart disease is a cause of, as a cause of reading difficulties. The article then described the treatment given a young girl afflicted with dyslexia, thyroid treatments, removal of tonsils and adenoids, exercises to strengthen her eye muscles. That's interesting. I suppose they hung little weights on her eyes and had her do exercise until she developed bulging muscles to help her read. Nowhere did they recommend teaching her the alphabet. Wouldn't that have been the simple thing to do? <laughs> but this was the kind of misinformation, disinformation that was going out to the public. And you can imagine these professors laughing all the way to the bank because by now they were carrying satchels of royalties money. They were selling these books by the millions. Every school district in America was using them. And they were getting rich in the process while destroying the intellect of millions of children, while crippling them academically, producing children that had to have their tonsils removed to improve their reading. 
But if heart disease is the cause of the problem, why are they removing her adenoids? That doesn't make sense. But apparently, you see, the editors of Life magazine no more were curious to find out the truth than that poor lady and the gentleman who wrote that article just last October in Sky Magazine. She actually thinks that there's a new evolutionary trend going on. Can you believe it? Mutations, genetics, they'll think of anything. And the public seems to just accept it. The public seems to just, you know, swallow this stuff. They're so gullible. And the educators, you know, they've been deceiving the public so long they take it for granted. They don't even, you know, blink an eye when they give out with these stories of how defective American children are with our epidemic. But a child comes to school at the age of six, the first grade, with a speaking vocabulary of between 5,000 and 35,000 words. Can you believe it? Can you believe that some children at six have a speaking vocabulary of 25,000 words? A minimum of 5,000, they say. Wow, that little kid's an intelligent human being. And, that, and the human child starts teaching himself to speak his own language virtually at birth. And so by the time he is six years old, he has developed his auditory and verbal skills to such a high degree that he's got a speaking vocabulary of between 5,000 and 35,000 words. And he's done it all by himself. He's literally taught himself to speak his own language all by himself without the help of Sesame Street. Without the help of cartoons, he's a very serious learner. He doesn't go around asking, are there any pictures? Children don't ask for pictures. They are listening very closely and they are learning. Very serious learners, very intelligent. And so when a youngster ent enters school at six years old and has taught himself to speak his own language, he feels pretty confident that he can learn to read. Wouldn't you? I mean. Is it more difficult to learn to read than it is to teach yourself to speak your own language at the age of two and three? So let us assume that Johnny is now ready to go to school. And mother sends him to school the first grade. And this is what little Johnny is expected to read. Now mind you, Johnny comes bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. He feels very intelligent, very smart, and you know how these kids are at five and six. They feel smarter than the adults. And he comes to school, and, this, and his teacher has the usual look-say, sight reading, sight vocabulary, teaching uh, program, and this is what he's told to read, or to memorize, or to guess. Dick, look, Jane, look, look. C. Dick, C. C. O. C. C. Dick, O. C. Dick, O. 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 Funny, funny Dick. Well, this kid sits there. He says to he, he's really at a loss, and he says to himself, "Gee, uh, either I'm crazy or she's crazy. This is not the way people talk." I mean, he should know. He's taught himself his own language. He's developed his auditory and verbal skills. He has a vocabulary of over 5,000 words. This is not how people talk. Gee, this school is a weird place. <laughs> but mother has said, now, Johnny, you behave yourself. You do what the teacher tells you to do. Be a good boy. And so Johnny decides, well, he's going to do what he's told to do, and he will behave himself, and he'll try to learn using maybe there's something to this. But let us assume that Johnny is one of that one-third who can't make it because he does not have a photographic memory. His skills are more auditory and verbal than visual. And there are a lot of kids like that, a lot of kids who don't have photographic memories. And so at the end of the first grade, he's having real problems. And mother is called to school and told, Mrs. Jones, Johnny has a reading problem. And by now, Johnny feels pretty awful. 
I mean, uh, he thinks, uh, well, maybe I'm not as intelligent as I thought I was. Maybe I'm really dumb. And uh, mother has told Mrs. Jones, Johnny will have to stay behind. And so Johnny stays behind, and by the end of the second year, he isn't doing much better. As a matter of fact, he's even doing worse. And so mother is called to school again and told, Mrs. Jones, Johnny has a learning disability. Johnny has dyslexia. Uh, he'll need special education. So he's put into a special classes. Mother is frantic. She's saying, what's wrong with my boy? I've given birth to a defective human being. He's got a learning defect. And she goes to doctors, you know, all those doctor's appointments that are made, and he's tested and retested and over-tested. And she's told, well, he's got a real problem, you know, he's got a learning disability, and so he needs all kinds of special uh, training. And by the end of the third grade, uh, things don't get any better, and by then, Johnny is fit to be tied. He is swinging from the rafters. He has become a behavioral problem. And so, mother again is called to school and told, Mrs. Jones, Johnny may have minimal brain damage. <laughs> I'm no kidding, these are the terms that are used by the ed minimal brain damage. Uh, in fact, if Johnny is to remain in school, he will have to take medication. And so they go back to the psychiatrists and they go through all the runaround of testing and all of that. And they decide that Johnny will have to take Ritalin if he wants to go to school. And what does Ritalin do? Well, by the fourth grade, Johnny is a regular little zombie. Destined to a life as a functional illiterate. You see, public education is no longer viable. It's not neutral. It really has never been neutral. It never will be neutral. And we are kidding ourselves when we think that we can even reform it to become neutral. It'll never be neutral. And so Christians have some very tough decisions to make. They must make those decisions very soon because the lives of their children are at stake. Now it will, it will require some inconvenience. But you know, when the Founding Fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence, they put their lives on the line. We would not be enjoying the freedoms we have today if they had been unwilling to put their lives on the line. And many of those men were very comfortable. They had big homes. They were wealthy. They didn't have to do what they did. They didn't have to sign that paper that... Uh, that that was an affront to the British Empire. But they said, we will put our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor on the line. And when that declaration was written, the King of England did not hand them their freedom on a silver platter. They had to go through six long years of suffering and bloodshed before they were able to fulfill that declaration and give us this nation that we have. Now, don't you think we ought to do something to save it? Don't you think it's worth saving? Don't you think you want your children to enjoy what we've had? They bequeathed us this marvelous country, and the humanists want to take it from us. We've got to stop them. The easiest way to stop them is simply get the kids out of their schools. That's their trump card, is their hold on education their hold on the minds of our children. That's their trump card. And you still have the freedom to remove your children. You still have the freedom to create private schools and home schools. You have that freedom. You've got to exercise it. If you don't, you're going you're to lose everything. Well, that's what we're up against. Our founding fathers set the example. It is up to us now to follow it. Thank you very much. Now that Mr. Blumenfeld has told us why Johnny can't read, let's take a look at computers in the classroom. Jeffrey Bodkin recently produced a television essay about an educational reform law titled H.R. 6. A former U.S. Educational Department official admitted that H.R. 6 is probably the most unconstitutional bill 
to ever pass through Congress. Let's listen while Jeffrey Botkin tells us what they're doing with computers in the classroom and exactly what is H.R. 6. The federal government will go to great lengths to keep every state in the OBE process and every student in the public schools. Bribery is one tactic, intimidation is another, but the worst has got to be lying to the public. In 1975, the federal government released a book on education reform. The book states that complete deception is one alternative to use when people are uncomfortable with new classroom innovations. I think it's about time America had an understandable definition of the most radical phase of outcome-based education. It's called transformational outcome-based education. It is not a great new academic program that will help Americans compete in the new global economy. It is an anti-intellectual, highly politicized federal bureaucracy designed to create a new controlled society. It eliminates traditional education from the classroom, assesses the political correctness of every student and teacher, creates a changing federal curriculum, psychologically manipulates the traditional beliefs of students, deliberately decreases the national knowledge level, deliberately restrains superior academic performance in every classroom. It re-educates adults in the workplace and electronically tracks the values, attitudes, and progress of everyone, punishing students and adults who do not conform. OBE represents a body of federal law that requires each individual citizen to think and act in ways outlined by powerful bureaucrats. This is transformational OBE. The two preceding phases of OBE are not as intimidating. Traditional OBE is hardly objectionable because real academic outcomes are still visible. But then phase two, transitional OBE, betrays the academic and sets the stage for what I have just defined. Because education reformer Carl Rogers advised his colleagues to, quote, change the name of the reform policy as fast as necessary to stay ahead of the critics, the OBE program in your state may go by another name. But every reform program beginning in the fall of 1994 in every school is federally monitored outcome-based education. Critics have now caught on to OBE, but it still has not received the scrutiny it has deserved because it is so well disguised as an improved curriculum for little children. Instead, OBE is the process that will control the very most intrusive government bureaucracies. There's one document that cuts through the mess and gives away what the government is really getting at. It's sort of a high-tech report card or diploma, the Certificate of Initial Mastery. It is supposed to indicate that the student has, quote, mastered the outcomes, end quote, necessary for graduation. But it's much more than that. Without this, it may be impossible to get a job, to get health care, to go to college, to get a driver's license, to travel around the country, or to vote. Let me repeat that. In the near future, anyone who doesn't have this OBE card could find it impossible to get a job, to get health care, to get a driver's license, to go to college, to travel, or to vote. Looking into a prototype classroom computer, you'll see how this little card locks a graduate into the OBE nightmare for life through something called lifelong learning. The number on this little card unlocks an electronic micro record of, well, let's look at the prototype for Janie Doe, number 447-54-2001. And keep in mind that this, that HR6 calls for this very kind of technology and makes absolutely no provision for the protection of the privacy of individual American citizens. If I had time to navigate around inside this computer, in these menus, I could find out lots of information on Janie's brother John or her dad, like his lifetime earnings, for example, and uh, his use of leisure time, and I'm told information on his morality and citizenship qualities, like 
whether or not he's registered to vote and how stable he is. Here's a sexuality file in which Janie identified how sexually active her parents and brothers and sisters were and whether they used contraceptives in the last six months. I could find the same details, these same details, on any designated computer in any typical personnel office, a tax office, a school health clinic, and a continuing education office where Janie will continue to be assessed the rest of her life. Her file will grow. Nothing will ever be erased from this, and she will continue to confront new outcomes any time the government wants to change them. Parents need to understand that transformational OBE outcomes are not what any parent would come up with. They are not even what any self-respecting teacher would come up with. Transformational OBE outcomes were set by the U.S. Department of Labor. They represent exactly what big government and global government advocates would like to achieve. When you study this little card, you see why most OBE outcomes have so little to do with reading, writing, arithmetic, and the pursuit of truly useful knowledge. Demonstrating attitudes is the issue. OBE outcomes are attitudes the government wants every citizen to have about politics, government orders, and individuality. In OBE classrooms, students learn real fast that traditional American ideas are not cool, that individuality is not cool. They find out that if they have any plans to learn, excel, or rise above the group, that they had better change their attitudes. They learn that the government wants them to go along with a very mediocre, compliant group the rest of their lives. That's why some students call this the certificate of slavery because every student is forced to stay in school until every government attitude is mastered. And your micro record can always tell you exactly where you stand. Here's a notice right here that Janie is late for a special vaccine she was supposed to get before her 21st birthday, and that she has not completed a required special remedial evening education class on global citizenship to be given at the neighborhood elementary school. These computer drills were custom designed to work on Janie's weaknesses, what the government identified as Janie's weaknesses. It was in these tests that Janie's shortcomings were identified and a federal curriculum designed to remediate Janie to fix her and every classmate, all of whom are considered weak. In coming stages of OBE, the government can determine how to remediate the way a child thinks with custom software for every child. Janie, for example, will enter her number into a modem, and the mainframe downloads her computer drill for the day, aimed at correcting the mistakes she made on the OBE tests. This is not academics, folks. This is not education. This is repetitive computer drilling to manipulate the way American children think and act. It is coercive thought control. H.R. 6 is not kid stuff. Not even the governments of Romania, Hungary, and Bulgaria have enjoyed the technological and psychological control over citizens that H.R. 6 will give America's top social engineers. Dr. James McConnell teaches psychology at the University of Michigan. Today, he begins his course by stating categorically that, quote, the time has come if you give me any normal human being. In a couple of weeks, I can change his behavior from what it is not to whatever you want it to be. Now, he asks, who's to decide what is to be done? H.R. 6 will be remembered as a bill that forever changed the United States of America. The current government is introducing the same OBE curriculum to every school in the country. It's a non-academic curriculum, part of which teaches that only the government has the answer for every problem, and that the government is to be trusted to provide the correct answer at the correct time. This is why the government is so concerned at every grade level with something called adaptability to change. 
the test measure at what point a citizen will allow the government to push him around in a group without protest. The National Education Association and top federal educators do approve of OBE drills and tests. They were designed around a psychological strategy which teaches that if a patient can be shocked and demoralized enough, he can be forced to change his most profound beliefs and behaviors. OBE's psychological therapies were proven to work on American students in experiments made on Pennsylvania kids. Here's one test given to an 11th grader to assess his grasp on the new government definition of family. The student made the mistake on the first question of going with the old definition, and it was marked wrong. The poor kid is only 79% politically correct and will need to be remediated. He will need to learn that families are not held together by blood, marriage, or adoption. Here's a test that rates a student's attitude toward the Second Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms. After reading opposing arguments, the students are asked very bluntly where they stand on the gun issue. Guess which position is the government-approved position in 1994? California parents criticize the new secret tests for the reason that the content is shocking, demoralizing, and non-academic. They object because students who let traditional concepts drift into their answers are penalized. In this essay, written about marriage, I'm told that the student who favored commitment, loyalty, and love received a lower score than the student who preferred separation and divorce. Every score, every test result, is permanently recorded in the student's file. Once a file is created, there is no escaping it. The student's value to the state is measured according to the progress he or she makes with each new test. Each student is reassessed from the most personal attitudes and values discovered on OBE tests. It is almost inconceivable to Americans that this invasion of personal privacy has already taken place. But these documents prove that the data has been and continues to be transmitted on dedicated telephone trunk lines to computer storage files and government mainframe computers. In 1978, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers warned about this unlawful political abuse of electronics technology, but the warning was not heeded. And in 1994, they published a summary of the abuses, which included, number one, collecting psychological, medical, sociological data on students and their families without their knowledge or consent via the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Number seven, the going online of the education supercomputer, the elementary and secondary integrative data system in 1989, which is linking the U.S. Department of Education with all 50 state education departments. Number eight, knowingly violating privacy laws as documents cite, quote, the need for changing privacy laws. Number nine, promoting the above under the rubric of educational restructuring under names like OBE, while withholding from the public the nature and extent of the data collection. Here's a document that shows the extent of OBE technology in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Finland, and Greece in the 1970s. This OBE system was developed in Hungary with UN guidance. This document was commissioned by the UN and held up as the desired system that every member nation must adopt to prepare all students everywhere to be the proper global citizens. School children who visit the UN lobby have reported seeing the big eight-foot-tall OBE map that indicates the nations who have now adopted Hungarian-style OBE technology. The UN believes this system will make world government possible by changing the minds and preparing the attitudes of every citizen in every member nation. The best clue to the OBE culture is contained in its tests. The student's name is always entered at the top of a test. Some tests do nothing but gather very personal information on the student's parents as well as his brothers and sisters. 
Most tests, however, constantly gather and regather psychological profile material. You will remember from part one that each student's personal data file is never erased, especially the answers to point blank questions like these sent to me from Florida. Of the 771 questions on this classroom test, not one is traditionally academic. Question, I like to eat my meals quickly and not spend a lot of time at the table visiting and talking. You will notice as we go through this test how many questions try to determine whether or not the student feels like he is part of the group. Conformity is one of the essential ingredients of this new order. If this student does not feel enough like a part of the group, he will need help. The school will provide it through OBE. Not academic help, but psychological help that will force conformity. Now the USA 2000 conference in 1968 nailed down these guidelines for their ideal, quote, environment for learning. They said, the teacher will have disappeared. His place will be taken by a facilitator of learning, focusing his major attention on the prime period for learning, from infancy to age six or eight. The student's unhappiness with parents will be an open part of his curriculum. And then it says, he will never be graduated. And this doctrine, this OBE doctrine of lifelong learning, means that every student will continue to return to the school, even in adulthood, to be assessed by the state. Now there's a popular teacher's book known as the NEA Bible, the National Education Association Bible. It instructs teachers to pursue this policy. It says, students must be made to feel so frustrated, so defenseless, so lost, so futureless in the prevailing system that they are willing to let go and take a chance on the future, end quote. So what this means is students who feel happy most of the time are not falling into line. They are not conforming to the OBE curriculum, but they too can be helped by OBE therapies. They too can feel properly pessimistic, which is clearly the government desired attitude for all students. The student will sit in front of a classroom computer like this, and he will drill and drill and drill not on academic challenges, but on the non-academic curriculum that will gradually change every attitude the government does not like. This is transformational outcome-based education. John Dewey, the so-called father of American public education, introduced the idea that high literacy is an obstacle to socialism. Anthony Ettinger admitted that he didn't think tomorrow's New World Order workforce needed much more education than a basic comic book level. One Department of Education official stated recently that today's newest reforms are drawn from the four pillars of the Chinese model of lifelong learning programs and community education to keep people working for the benefit of the state their entire lives. Pillar one, she said, eliminates tests and grades. Pillar two makes truth a relative concept. Pillar three makes education serve the masses. Pillar four combines education with productive labor. Indeed, today's top educators have become precisely what Zbigniew Brzezinski predicted back in 1970. He said they will be a highly internationalist elite with a globalist outlook. He indicated that their technotronic society would exploit the latest communication techniques to manipulate emotions and control reason. He observed human beings becoming increasingly manipulable and malleable. He observed the increasing availability of biochemical means of human control. He observed a national information grid that will integrate existing electronic data banks and a common educational program. Indeed, what today's top change agents have designed for American education fits this vision. It is an education fit for slaves, people who do not have the knowledge or character to protest their place in the new system. 
I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who helped make this film possible. I hope it has been very informative for you. My nearly two years of study on outcome-based education are now complete. The hardest part was reducing some 5,000 documents and hours of film into a 289-page book and a two-hour video and still give you full knowledge of my findings. The hardest job of all is now on your shoulders, the job of taking back your school. Those who control education control the mind of America. That control must stay with the people, not the government. In the five minutes remaining, I want you to meet some of America's future leaders, the reason that we need to stand tall and fight outcome-based education. And I'd like to show you how to get more information on OBE. Thank you, and may God bless you all.